I like the description in the program, which says uh, the program invites us to, quote, take a look at Colorado's future with CDOT's top transportation innovator, Lisa Streisfeld. It's a pretty good introduction, but um, I will mention that uh, Lisa has over 25 years experience uh, in transportation planning, operation, transit, environmental management, and performance management. She currently serves as the Assistant Director of Mobility Services for the Colorado Department of Transportation Advanced Mobility RODEX program, where she is focusing on mobility as a service, mobility on demand, and rapid speed transportation. Uh, Lisa has previously served as a planning commissioner in the city of, of Manitou Springs and the transportation planning manager for the town of Castle Rock. Please welcome Lisa Streisfeld. Okay, I should be on. Can people hear me? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for that nice introduction. Um, I've currently been working for CDOT for about 15 years, and uh, I wanted to just kind of go through our program of really interesting projects that we're working on. Um, a little bit about our agency. I love this slide because it just shows how big we are. Um, we have over 3,000 bridges. We plow over 6.1 million miles of roadway. Um, we have over 23,000 lane miles and 35 mountain passes. Um, I just found out we have about 160 avalanches to deal with with that last big snow cyclone. Some of those were man-made, some of those were human-induced. Um, we also have over 70 airports with our Division of Aeronautics, and we have our Division of Transit and Rail, which operates Bustang. Um, we have a big challenge here. Our population is growing, and we're looking at up to 7.8 million people by 2040. That's a 47% growth. Um, that increases the amount of miles traveled and the amount of people actually on our roadways. So we're looking at average traffic delay increasing possibly two to three times. And as we know, we have decreasing revenue. So how do we address that? How do we look at the issues with all of that demand on our roadway? Um, we did a study with Texas Transportation Institute just last year for our top 100 congested corridors. Um, each year, we're looking at 85 million hours of delay each year, 27.8 millions of gallons of fuel each year. Um, all that corresponds to over $1.6 billion in congestion. And does anyone know about what our CDOT budget is? Right around 1.3 to 1.4 billion. So right now the congestion is costing us more than our annual budget. So we have a new executive director. This is Director Shoshana Liu. She started in January. She has four key objectives for us to look at. One, for safer travel, um, reducing crashes, improving safety conditions on our roadway, looking at more multimodal options, reducing emissions, and delivering construction projects on time and on budget. So what does the future of transportation even look like? Well, we want it to be safe. We want it to be reliable. We want it to address that congestion. It's going to be shared, it's going to be multimodal, and it's going to be connected, automated, sustainable, and electrified. And I'm going to go through a few projects that we've been working on over the past uh, couple of years and be happy to entertain questions at the end. Um, just for safety improvements, we're focusing on striping and guardrail. With um, driverless vehicles, that's the number one thing we've heard from OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, they want good striping so the cars can see where they are. Um, we're looking at faster traffic incident management, work zone safety, the high performance transportation enterprise. They're developing an express lane master plan and just overall improved traveler safety. Here's one small project that we're working on. Um, this is a device called Wheelwright. We're going to install this at the Hogback Park and Ride. Um, as you can see from this picture, there's some panels embedded into the ground. When a driver drives their vehicle over it, it will tell them what their tread depth is, as well as what their tire pressure is. So why is that good? Well, better tire pressure um, reduces emissions because you're getting higher fuel efficiency from your car. Better tread depth is safer, especially on um, inclement weather conditions. This technology comes out of the United Kingdom and it's the second installation in the United States. 
Um, the high performance transportation enterprise, they're working on an express lane master plan. So they're really thinking about where does that next told expressway go? And um, as you can see, you know, they're looking at corridors possibly, or they are doing the one between Castle Rock and Monument. That's the GAP project that's under construction now. Um, and you can see the ones that have been completed already, like the US 36 corridor and the I-70 mountain express lanes. I pulled this from their annual report just because people ask quite a bit. So over 9% of the traveling public are using that I-70 mountain express lanes. Um, overall, each year about 15.8 million of vehicles are using that network. Um, 2.6 of those trips are HOV. And also they're just doing lots of public outreach. They've done media campaigns. And uh, they've had three groundbreaking events this year for Central 70 in the metro area, I-25 North up to Wells County, and then as I mentioned before, the I-25 Gap project. Um, just some factoids there, also US 36 corridor had over 3 million annual transit trips. That reduced almost 19,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions. So these express lanes are giving people choices and they're also making transit better and faster. So I just, this little piece of data, I love this. Um, the before and after, if you see the different colors, that's Martin Luther King Day, January um, 2012, 13, 14, and 15. And you can see by 16, that's the red color, that was where the improvement was done. Um, the axis on the, on the side there, that's minutes of travel. So you can see for all previous years, it took a really long time, really inconsistent minutes of travel, but once we installed the express lane, you can see the minutes of travel was right around 15 minutes. So that express lane in a peak operational day is really making a difference. Another thing that we do, traffic incident management. How many people are aware that we actually have a CDOT courtesy patrol? Okay, about half. So we put out um, a heavy tow truck on the I-70 corridor. We pay that tow truck to sit there. We also have several courtesy patrol um, trucks all around the metro area. They will push you to the next intersection if you are stalled. They will give you a gallon of gas. They will jump you if your battery is dead. And um, we just want to increase the speed of traffic incident management. For every minute that there's a crash on the road, it takes four minutes for the highway to recover. So if you have a 15 minute crash, that's one hour of congestion. So every minute counts. And this particular slide, um, we're looking at all sorts of technology oh. to look at how can we more quickly clear that incident off the roadway. So we've been looking at incident detection software, so smart cameras that actually alert our traffic management center, hey, there's something on the road, there's a mattress, there's a crash. Um, we have cameras and operators. We are co-locating co with Colorado State Patrol in our Colorado Traffic Management Center in Golden. We built a new traffic management center in Pueblo. We've been deploying our courtesy patrol. We're doing traffic incident management corridor plans. We've been training people um, on clearing incidents, so we're working more closely with state patrol, county sheriffs, emergency response, tow and recovery. And then we're also just doing a lot of after action reviews. Um, it's a rather complicated timeline, but basically T0 is when an incident occurs and T7 is when you go back to normal traffic flow. And so every one of those segments, if we can try to notch that down, that'll reduce the amount of congestion because if we clear the incident more quickly, we're going to get back to normal flow more quickly. So some of the other things that we've been doing, we've been doing training. We have a partnership with State Farm. They're also helping to fund some of our courtesy patrol program. We did a TIM track, traffic incident management, out in Douglas County. Um, we did a cost share with Douglas County Emergency Vehicle Operations Center. We opened that up last April and we're training first responders on this track, how to more quickly create clear a crash off the roadway. And this is in a protected area, but a great partnership. Um, we've also been training people in traffic incident management. Um, this is just the number of first responders and we're up to 40% 
we've exceeded our goal of first responders trained in traffic incident management. So all these are just little ways to really try to address crashes. It's one of the highest returns on investment that we can do for congestion. We also implemented a program called Pathfinder. Um, you might have seen it. We wanted to get better information to our drivers on the road about inclement weather conditions. So we've been coordinating with our traffic management center, our Office of Emergency Management, our regions, Colorado Avalanche Information Center, National Weather Service, and trying to really get the information out to the public. What is the weather? When is it going to occur? What will the roadway conditions be? And what's the impact to the network? This gives people better choices. So we've been doing this at CDOT. It's part of a national effort. And you'll see a lot of our messaging, you know, heavy snow expected on Tuesday afternoon on Highway 103. Delays expected. We're trying to give people better information so they can make good choices. So we're going to be integrating fully into um, our traffic management center. And then what does that do? Well, there's it's impact-based weather information. Hopefully people make better choices. What car do they bring? Um, what time do they take their trip? What route are they going to take? What speed are they going to drive? All of those so people can get there more safely maybe even reducing trips during that actual weather event, and that way our maintenance workers can get out on the road, clear the road more quickly, and overall that reduces crashes, improves safety, and gets the road back to dry, pa dry pavement more quickly. Another innovative project we're doing, this one's called Smart 25. We're, going, we're in design right now, we'll be um, constructing the fiber this particular um, spring, and then next spring we'll actually be implementing it. What is Smart 25? Well, on 19 interchange ramps, they're all gonna talk to each other on I-25 northbound. It goes from Ridgegate up to University. And basically there's gonna be these little counters on the sides of the road called TURTLES, it's an acronym. Um, they use lasers and they talk to each other. They're looking at the speed of the vehicle. They're looking at how many vehicles. So if the roadway gets kind of congested, the ramp meters are gonna slow people down. As the roadway clears out, the ramp meters are gonna speed up. And so all 19 are gonna talk to each other. So it's constantly in motion. Right now our ramp meters are pretty static. So during rush hour, they're at one speed, red, green, red, green. Now they're gonna be constantly talking and adjusting. Um, this technology, the software actually comes out of Greece. It was first implemented in Australia. We're bringing in Vic Roads, which is their Department of Transportation in Australia to help us deploy this. They saw a 25% increase in capacity in Australia. We're hoping for maybe 20% because the Australians apparently are much more mindful in keeping speed limits than we are here in the United States. But we really are excited um, about this project. So what else about the future of transportation? Well, it's going to be multimodal. We're going to invest in mobility hubs. We're going to expand regional transportation and transit service with our bus staying, our outrider. We're going to look at snow staying again. We're planning for high-speed rail. We're going to work with all of our MPOs, metropolitan planning organizations, to increase our ride share programs. Um, North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization, Pikes Peak, and Dr. Cog all have van pool programs. Those all have a really high return on investment. We want to continue to support transportation demand management. We're going to track our performance, and we're also going to be reformatting our state transportation plan to make sure that it's heavily multimodal. Um, just a picture of our bus staying. We really want to accelerate bus staying's expansion into the outrider. That's a more rural routes, like along US 50. We're going to be investing in mobility hubs. We're looking at and we're proposing to our commission that we dedicate about $50 million in the next calendar year to the front range and to the rest of the state to build these mobility hubs. And what does that mean? Well, it's not just a park and ride. It's a park and ride that might have Wi-Fi. It might have electric vehicle charging stations. It will have access to Waze carpool and um, first and last mile services. Maybe there's some scooters, maybe there is some shopping, um, good curb space management, so Lyft and Uber can get in and out more quickly. So really provide people with a lot of transportation options. 
Um, I found this cartoon on the internet off of Sandbag's website. But again, a mobility hub, it's not just a building, but it's a location within a community where all these transportation services can connect. Um, we really want to make sure that the local transit provider is connecting to our regional transit provider. So hopefully we'll get Bustang and let's say um, the Eco Transit or what is it, the one down in Pueblo, Pueblo Transit, Colorado Springs Mountain Metro Transit, connect all of those. And then in the future, maybe that would be a rail station if we can get that rail built. Um, just a map of our Bustang routes, you can see the purple are, is along the I-70 and the I-25 corridor. The outrider is that nice turquoise color and that's going to Gunnison to the west and Lamar to the east. And then all of that would again be connecting to the brown lines which are more of the inner city bus corridors. So I just threw these slides in. The idea of a rural mobility corridor, there'd be a bike lane, there'd be parking, there'd be bus stops, there'd be some sidewalks. An urban one might also have um, some commercial areas like a barbershop or a restaurant. Maybe there's a bike lane, an ATM, just a place where people want to be, but also provide really good transportation connection. And then also a highway mobility hub. Maybe there's a pedestrian walkway, um, future office or residential. We also would have a transit station. So a study we just finished up at Colorado DOT was on rapid speed transportation. Um, we called it a benefits and opportunities study. So what we did here is we looked not at the route, we kind of looked at the guts of how do you make a really expensive transportation project happen. And so we looked at um, what agency would actually regulate some type of new technology? Um, what kind of governance structure would apply? Um, what kind of environmental or NEPA process would we have to go through? Who would actually own the land? Who would own the track? Who would own the vehicles that go on the track? And then who would own these hubs or the transit stations? And we found that, you know, most likely we'll be working with the Federal Railroad Administration. But again, if this is on CDOT right-of-way, we'll also be working with Federal Highway Administration. Um, in this feasibility analysis, we'll, we looked at um, what is the state of the technology, and in the future, we'll be developing an operations plan. So that overall implementation framework, just the basic steps through construction, where we plan a project, we procure the items, we implement, and then we operate. And so we looked at all of those factors. Who would manage it for project management and oversight? likely would be some type of P3 public-private partnership. Another thing what, about the future of transportation, I said the word shared. Well, what do we mean by shared? Well, that's everything from carpooling to multimodal options to ride sharing. There's several companies out there right now. Um, there's Waze has a carpool program. There's um, a company coming out called Gondola. Gondola is going to have a ride share specifically for skiers on the I-70 mountain corridor. So we really want to just encourage these developers by providing them good data. Um, bike share and scooter share. Also this, I love that little slide at the bottom left. That's give a soldier a ride program at Fort Carson. So again, a carpooling program that they're promoting at the base. Other emergent strategies. Have any, any of you heard about our autonomous bus out of DIA in 61st and Pena? Great, that's a picture of it. This is an actual route on RTD's network. Um, this is the Easy Mile shuttle. The technology comes out of France. It goes about 18 miles an hour. It truly is driverless. Um, they do have an operator on board for emergency situations, but if you get off at 61st and Pena, you can take this on a, a loop. Um, I also put this slide in on the bottom right. This is a driverless suitcase. And you would be like, Lisa, why, why are you showing me a driverless suitcase? Well, you can actually buy these on Amazon. This follows you by an app on your phone. But here's the idea. You're going to reduce a trip to the grocery store, because maybe now you're going to be willing to walk to the grocery store, because you don't have to carry the groceries. That's the concept. But there's all these emergent technologies that are coming out. And all of these, we're looking at how can we reduce that single occupancy vehicle on the roadway. We looked at, um, we did a TDM study. We looked at cost effectiveness of emission reductions. And as I said earlier, traffic incident management really gives you the biggest bang for the buck. So cost per pollutant unit reduced, incident management and park and rides really are the top two. 
Um, transit service, that's also um, close in the next three. But when we look at programs like bike sharing and ride sharing, they're much more expensive per pollutant actually reduced. So that's one thing that we really want to focus on at, at CDOT is where are we going to get our highest return on investment for some of these programs. Hence, I had so many slides on traffic incident management, but it's a really high bang for the buck to reduce congestion. Um, we put it in this really colorful matrix. We looked at project costs. Um, that's at the bottom axis. So over to the right side, those are projects that are over a million. These are projects 200 to a million and then under 200,000. And then we looked at what's the vehicle miles traveled reduced. And as you can see, telling people to telecommute to stay home great way to reduce VMT. Um, also van pooling, really high return on investment. School pools, doing transit for special events. So those are um, some great options. Other things that really have high effectivity are inner city transit and intelligent transportation solutions. That's more of the technical side, but again, those are more expensive options. So part of this TDM plan, I put this chart in is we started to survey what's even going on in Colorado. So we looked at Dr. Cog, we looked at the inner mountain area, and we looked at what type of mobility options are we already having in these different areas. And this is giving us a good idea of, okay, well, maybe there's not um, bus rapid transit or light rail transit in Durango, but does it make sense maybe to do some more marketing campaigns or parking management to help them? So just looking at a balance of what strategies are we already implementing and where are the gaps and maybe where should we make future investments. Another partnership that CDOT's doing with RTD, we're working with this company called Masabi. And yes, apparently I talked to the, the app developer, it did come out off of Wasabi, they were out for sushi, so I had to ask, it's true. Um, the idea is to combine all of the ticketing capability to buy a transit ticket into one app. So you could then go to this one website, you can get a ticket for RTD, you can get a ticket to Bustang, you can get a ticket for transport up in Fort Collins. And let me get to the next slide. So you have one location, and so then there's one platform. And so really it helps people for trip planning because it connects the bus schedules for all those different providers, and then you only make one payment because you'll buy a ticket for the full route. So literally you can get um, from Fort Collins all the way to Denver with the app. And again, they've been looking at, all right, well, how do we do those connections physically on the map? And the idea then would be in the future, maybe you would build this out into other networks for other transit providers. What else about transportation? Well, it's going to be, um, connected and automated. So I was just gonna go over a few of our projects. One is an autonomous attenuator. Um, we've been looking at our CDOT fleet. We've been looking at transportation network provider vehicles like Uber and Lyft. Um, Inrix is a software that we're using. And what that does is it tells us real time within three seconds how fast the cars are going on different corridors. Um, we're putting together a data platform called Daisy and um, also looking at things like truck platooning. So have you guys heard of truck platooning? You've seen people draft before, right? You've seen bicyclists in the, the bike races. Well, it's the same concept with 18 wheelers with these commercial motor vehicles. They can receive a 9% fuel savings if they can draft off each other. So I went out to visit Daimler out in Portland, Oregon, and they are working on this technology. There's a company here in Colorado called Peloton that's also working on this technology. So if you start talking to FedEx or Walmart or Amazon that we can save you 9% on your fuel costs, they're really perking up. So what this is is that the vehicles are connected, they're talking to each other, so if the front truck is braking, the next truck is also braking. But by platooning, they're drafting and again getting that fuel savings. Um, we're also looking at infrastructure so we can tell people about uh, what type of work zones might be ahead, uh, parking, uh, excuse me, crash notifications ahead, and then overall I'll be talking a little bit about we have a truck parking information system that we're working on. So this is our autonomous attenuator. Um, it's a crash truck. In the past there was a person who actually drove this truck. They would follow a paint crew. Paint crew goes along painting and this truck follows behind. It actually is a big spring that it kind of rolls off the back and some construction worker, maintenance worker was sitting there guarding the paint zone. 
Well, in order to create a safer situation, we purchased an autonomous one that automatically just follows the paint crew. Then we've taken a worker out of harm's way. So there's no one sitting in this crash truck waiting to protect um, that work zone from an errant vehicle. So we already have one in operation in um, northern Colorado up to the Weld County Region 4 area. And we have applied for a grant from the US DOT to buy a few more of these so we can deploy them elsewhere in Colorado. We're really excited about this technology because one, it's showing how automation can improve safety. And two, it, we're getting it out there. I mean, we're actually logging miles. Um, I wanted to show you guys a quick video, we'll see if this loads up. We did an autonomous truck delivery. going to take it a minute to boot up. Um, we did this in partnership with a company called Otto, O-T-T-O, and actually Budweiser. So this was done in 2016. Let me see if I can make this large now. Nope, it's not going to do it that way. So we drove a 100-mile route on I-25 from Fort Collins to Colorado Springs. The driver was out of the seat. And The driver would still be involved with the pickup, loading the freight, making sure it's secure in the back of the vehicle. And then once you're on the interstate, one switch, and it's driving itself down the road. Well, auto technology is all about making the road safer. It's like a train on, on software rails. And so when you will see a vehicle driving with nobody in it, you'll know that it's very unlikely to get an collision. I proclaimed to one of the technicians, I said, I don't think I could have done that better myself. Uh, that was an interesting moment. We knew we wanted an iconic American brand that was passionate about their products. Budweiser was a perfect partner. I think the most important things that computers are going to do in the next 10 years is drive trucks and cars. So it's great to be uh, at the forefront of that. CDOT even looking at this, well, this is really the future, and so we want to make the future as safe as possible. Um, why would commercial motor vehicles be even interested in this technology? Well, right now, they have to have a digital logging management system for commercial motor vehicles. And so what this does is it allows the drivers to take more breaks, and then they can actually drive further because they're on a break actually in the vehicle. When we deployed this back in 2016, we worked very, very closely with Colorado State Patrol, Colorado Department of Revenue um, as well to make sure the deployment was um, safe. We did a roadway clearance where we cleared all the debris 
prior to the deployment. But again, it was a really exciting project to demonstrate how this technology could work. So what else are we doing? Well, the future of transportation, it's going to be sustainable and electrified. One of Governor Polis's first executive orders was on electric vehicles. Um, he wanted to create an electric vehicle work group. Um, he asked the de health department to create a Colorado zero emission vehicle program. He asked us to re-examine the use of the Volkswagen settlement funds. He wanted CDOT to develop some type of zero emission vehicle and clean transportation plan. So we've been working on all of that at CDOT. Um, also, we've been converting our state fleet to electric. That's a photograph from our parking garage here at CDOT. You can see all the charging stations and all of the state fleet that are electric. Um, we've been working really closely with a national renewable energy lab. And we're also studying something called smart powered roads. So this whole concept is um, out of, we're working with the vendor consortium, I guess it's a vendor with University of Utah called Select. We're looking at smart powered roadways where the cars would be charged inductively. Have any of you seen those cell phone chargers where you just lay your cell phone on it? Same concept with the electric vehicle. Why would you do this? Well, for some routes, like a shuttle route at the airport as an example, that's a route that the vehicle's doing constantly. So you want to avoid having to park the vehicle and charge it in for four hours, and it's out of service. So by being inductively charged, it's constantly charging on that route. The other um, advantage is that your battery can actually be a little smaller if it's constantly getting a charge. So then you're getting more miles per charge with a smaller battery. So we're studying this as a future option. Um, we've also talked about could we do solar in the right of way maybe to even help charge this smart powered road. Um, and then we're also looking at um, possibly an electric vehicle scenic byway. So what do I mean by that? Let me go down this slide. So Oregon has already um, put together a scenic byway plan and they're going to promote EV tourism. So basically like come out, come visit Oregon, use your electric vehicle, and then we have plenty of charge stations along our scenic byways. So we're investigating this right now. We really like the idea um, just because it creates a good partnership. Um, I had one of our interns start putting a map together. This is a map of our scenic byways in Colorado. The solid green line means that there are um, electric charging stations on that corridor. The dotted lines means that it's lacking. So this is just early stages of planning, like could we do this? Um, another thing that we're doing, this is a small project, but it's really fun. This is a luminaire or a light. It is powered by both solar and wind turbine. It's called an Omni light. We've put one in at CDOT. Um, I think they've installed them about eight other locations in the state, including one in the Greenland open space by the I-25 GAP project. And um, as you can see, it's pretty bright. And um, because it's spinning, the pigeons don't sit on top of it. <laughs> but it's nice because if you know, the, you're not getting a bright sunny day, if you still have some wind, it's getting powered. And um, there's been a lot of interest expressed in this because basically you can provide light in an area where you don't necessarily have a utility. So again, a really good opportunity to increase safety at a little less of a cost. So innovative mobility, what do I mean by connected? Well, connected vehicles, that concept means that each car is talking to each other. Um, cars really produce a whole lot of data already. They all have an OBU, an onboard unit, and um, the manufacturers, they're already looking at, I mean, like when you get your emissions tested now and you, it gets plugged in, they're plugging into your onboard unit to look at your vehicle emissions. So in addition, the cars will start talking to each other to avoid collisions, um, do not pass, intersection assisting, platooning. Um, some of the newer cars have that Cruise control, which is automated and adjusted, so there's an actual camera. It's looking at the car in front of you. So that's the beginning of this connectivity of platooning cars. We've talked about the idea of maybe we have a connected highway where that managed lanes, instead of just being a told lane, 
that would be a lane where connected cars would go in, so you could actually get more capacity because all the cars are going to be talking to each other. They're going to draft off each other. So that's something we've been thinking about. Um, also, this concept of our infrastructure, CDOT, actually talking to the vehicle. So can we tell that car, hey, there's a work zone ahead, there's a curve speed ahead, there, um, there's some variable message signs out, I think it's up in California, where the truck goes over a way station, the way station weighs how much the truck is, it looks at what the weather conditions are, and then for the downhill speed, it recommends what kind of speed it should go down. So maybe it's a full load, it's pretty steep, the weather's bad, maybe it recommends 10 miles an hour versus if it's a nice sunny day, maybe it, goes, it would recommend 45 miles an hour. Right now, we, they're putting that on a static variable message sign out on the highway. Well, the whole concept is we could take that same information and directly put it into the car and you would get it maybe on a voice to text message. Um, also, like icy corners, uh, take a detour route, signal phase and timing. We're looking at a project on the State Highway 85 corridor um, up in our Region 4 area. Here's the concept. You know how when a big truck has to stop at a traffic light, it slows down, everyone else has to slow down, and it t there's a lot of latency. Then the light turns green, it's got to slow up, but everyone behind that truck is waiting, waiting, waiting till the truck gets enough speed to get through the light. Well, the concept is to have signal priority for that truck. So the truck would communicate to the tra traffic light, hey, I'm approaching, traffic light would stay green and let that truck go through. That way you eliminate the starting and the stopping and try to keep the flow more optimized. Um, we put in a grant application for the same concept um, here in the metro area to do it for our snow plows. So hopefully if we get the grant money, we can try this project out. I think um, they were looking at Wadsworth and Arapaho Road, again, to let the plows through. So that's the concept of where our infrastructure is speaking with the vehicle. Just I wanted to go through that graphic a little bit. So let's say that two cars collide. They're going to be picked, that information will be picked up by one of our roadside units. That's what this is here, little RSU. And so that information will go to our data ecosystem. I'll show it to you later. It's called DAISY. And uh, that then would be projected out either to a car or to a sign to let the other cars know, hey, there's a crash ahead. So great information for us. Also, we can notify an emergency responder. Hey, there was a crash. So again, quicker incident response. So that's just one idea of connectivity. How do we do that? Well, you know, there's two different ways. One is DSRC, digital short range communication. That's more of a radio cellular. We can also do it with fiber. So if we, like, you know, I see Tony here, the more fiber we can build out, the more connectivity we can actually have on our roadways. So CDOT's been working on a lot of public-private partnerships to expand um, our fiber network just so we can get ready for this technology that's coming. Um, by 2022, we've heard that you know, Volkswagen, Toyota, and Ford, and Volvo are going to be rolling out this connectivity on their cars. And uh, that's why we're building out our roadside sensors, our fiber, building out our data platform, and then just streamlining that data real time so we can better operate our roads. I kind of, like, I teach a class to our maintenance workers, and um, I explain it kind of like this. You know how you go to Disney World? The rides pretty much stay the same year to year, but they seem to just be able to push more people through the roadway, because they've got cameras and everything's electronic. And basically, they're just squeezing more capacity out of their system, getting more people on those rides and through. Well, that's the idea that CDOT wants to do, is how do we operate these roads more efficiently to push more people through the system. And so we're hoping that this connectivity is one of those ways that helps increase that um, mobility and safety. So DAISY, that's a platform that we're working on. The acronym stands for Data Analytics Intelligence System, with a small y, as I've been told. Um, it's a Google-based platform. It's basically the concept is to bring all the data that we're getting from connected cars, from National Weather Service data, 
from, we have roadway, roadway weather information systems. So they're called RWIS stations all over the state, which tells us precipitation and roadway temperature, um, things about work zones. Getting all of that into one particular network, using predictive analytics and artificial intelligence to then forecast what the roadway condition might be. So you know you can uh, you use your phone, you're on Waze, or Google will tell you how long it'll take you to get from point A to point B. We're basically putting that on steroids, where we would have better weather information, past historical traffic volume, and give better real-time um, arrival for people, or real-time detour routing. Um, there was a while back, um, I think it was about two years ago, that Google was sending people over Independence Pass in the middle of winter um, because I think I-70 was closed. And so, you know, <laughs> we took a few phone calls, but we found the right people at Google. Hey, you know, it's closed, it's winter. But again, if we as a state can provide that information to our commercial motor vehicle drivers or um, people just trying to get to the hospital or work or school so they can make better travel decisions. Um, long term, that really helps us to have a more automated system. Another project we're working on, real-time work zone information. Um, basically, we have these connected devices. They're called eye pins. It's basically this big yellow pin. Throw it right in the top of um, a cone. And that basically is projecting out. I'm here, I'm here as a work zone. We then ingest that data. And right now, the data is going to Waze. So Waze is getting real-time information. We're working on ingesting that into our ecosystem as well. And then as the cones are moved real time, we have real time lane opening and closing. Right now, how do we tell people that there's a work zone? Once a week, a traffic engineer provides a report to our communications office. They put together a big spreadsheet, lane one, mile post two, lane one, mile post six, all the opening and closings. That's hand done then entered into a GIS system, and then it's entered in for the week. Well, you guys know traffic and um, construction workers, sometimes the schedules are perfect, sometimes they might be off in a, a day or two or an hour. So this really provides an enhanced system, and I've got a little bit of a, another video here. Lane closures are a key source of traffic congestion and frustration all around the world. Today, and even more so in the future, drivers and vehicles need information about work zones, on navigation apps, on in-vehicle screens, and eventually directly to self-driving cars. Now, with a partnership between CDOT's RoadX program, ICONE, Colorado Barricade, Panasonic North America, and here, we can put work zones on the map. Together, we're rolling out a portable, affordable device that provides real-time location information for work zones with the drop of a pin. This connected pin fits inside any standard traffic cone. The GPS location of the work zone is shared instantly. The moment the cone hits the ground with CDOT, navigation apps, and motorists. And when that cone is picked up, the system recognizes the work zone is gone and immediately communicates that update. This isn't someone sitting in an office entering in the location of a work zone planned last week. This is accurate, immediate information, giving drivers and vehicles a real-time understanding of roadway activities and making the traveler and work zone safer. Through the power of partnership, we're preparing for the future of smart and eventually autonomous transportation while delivering immediate benefits today. Together, we're putting real-time work zones on the map. I just have like three more slides for you guys, so we'll have time for questions. Um, another project we're working on, a truck parking information management system. Why are we doing that? Well, again, like I mentioned, the commercial motor vehicle drivers, they have limited hours of service, and now it's digitally tracked. So they need to find a parking location along the interstate or a state highway, 
And what's happening is if they don't know where a parking space is available, they're trolling. They're going up and down. They're slowing down. They're getting off the interchange, on, looking for parking. So what this pilot project is doing is we are working with a company called TSPS. We are now tracking parking availability at four locations on the I-70 East Corridor. Two are at Love's gas station, so private parking lots, and two are at our rest areas, one at Araba and one at Burlington. And so a commercial motor vehicle driver can log on to the TSPS website. This one, um, they, you know, it's logging on for Araba and it's saying six out of the 10 spaces are available and there are um, lights available and a flush toilet. So it tells them what facilities are there. If they went on to a Loves, it might say restaurant and showers as well. We also then take that information and we're broadcasting it to a sign. This sign's called a variable message sign and it's telling the drivers how many spaces are available. So eight at the rest area and 63 at exit 405. So again, really good information so our commercial motor vehicles can make better choices about their trips. Um, also, we're hoping you know, in an emergency situation where an interstate is closed, we now would ingest that data and be able to tell commercial motor vehicles drivers and state patrol where parking is available. Um, currently, we have a, an agreement like, I think it's with Copper Mountain Ski Resort, that truckers can use their overflow parking in an emergency. But again, we're doing a truck parking inventory statewide. And um, the next step is to put that inventory onto a GIS database and uh, then hopefully expand a system like this so we can make that available for the whole state on all the highways because it really will help our commercial motor vehicle drivers. Um, overall, that also decreases emissions because they're trolling less looking for spaces. So bringing all this together, CDOT is just about to finish up something called a smart mobility plan. Um, basically, it assesses how ready are we as a state um, for all of this technology. It's putting a toolbox together so our local partners can also look at what technology we're using. So if we're using, I'm making this up, cam a Smith camera, then the local government, maybe they want to use a Smith camera so they're compatible. Um, also, it'll address things like transit information, traffic control, um, better data management. All this basically becomes part of the ITS architecture, and that's how the fiber, the power, the actual lights, the signals, how all of that connects. Um, and that'll be a precedent to our statewide transportation plan, so we'll know where to make those future investments. Um, also, it'll talk about some of these strategies, like you know this ramp metering project, or maybe additional um, truck parking information management systems. But again, trying to use our existing infrastructure more efficiently, so we're not just adding another lane, but we're trying to use what we have. Um, so, how does all that work? Well, you know, we have the automation, we have the information that goes into our network, whether it's for energy. Um, automated automation, safety and operations, all that goes into our DAISY system, and that gets communicated back out to different vehicles. So that's what I had for you. We ha definitely have 10 minutes for questions. I'm, I'm happy to entertain. We're going to do a little break before 2.30. Sure. Do you want to take one or two questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Any questions? Thoughts? Too long? <laughs> yes. So this is really encouraging. Congratulations. Um, what are what, just a high-level summary of what you're going to do from like deployment on scale? What are the biggest challenges you're facing? The biggest challenges? I think the biggest challenge is the data, the volume of data. How do we collect it? How do we keep it secure? How do we transmit it? And when do we dump it? Yeah. So I think that to me is a really active area where the state DOT has to work closely with OIT. Are there grants available for, you know, our community was looking into those carpooling ride sharing apps and the initial cost is substantial for a smaller community. Are there grants available for this? Yes. 
Yes, so C if you're in an MPO area, um, CMAP grants are certainly available. That's congestion mitigation air quality. But there's also some smaller grants called STIC and um, a, a grant called AID, uh, Acceleration in Innovation and Deployment. And if you, I'll give you my card and we can correspond and I can give you what I know about. I don't know either. <laughs> well, we better, better take a break. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for a very, very interesting presentation. Clearly, there, is, there are many, many innovations going on with CDOT. Yes. I had no idea. And uh, we do have a small gift for you and, oh. uh, for, to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And, so uh, next presentations are at 2.30.